الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودع لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجن الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن هؤلاء يحبون العاجلة ويذرون وراءهم يوما ثقيلا اللهم لا تجعلنا منهم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين I'd like to start by saying that I feel incredibly honored and grateful to have the opportunity to address you here at uh, ISNA Canada and especially that I feel out of place because my dear teacher and our a father to this community and to the larger North American community, Sheikh Abdullah Idris is sitting here in front of us and I felt the moment I walked in, I was reminded of the old Arabic saying, Aghna sabah anil misbah, the, when the morning comes, you don't need a lamp. So, <laughs> but uh, regardless, now that I am in this place, I, I would like to share with you just some reminders about some things that I've been thinking about in terms of my own study of the Quran and interactions that I've been having, particularly with uh, younger uh, Muslims from around the world, uh, and they have to do with guilt. So where I want to start today's khutbah and, uh, and our discussion is something about our deen and what we should feel guilty about and what we shouldn't feel guilty about. So obviously, you know, Allah Azza wa has given us a set of expectations. That here's some things you're supposed to do as a believer. Here are some things you're supposed to stay away from. And we all know them. They're, they're clear as day to everybody. There's a certain way you and I are supposed to be with our parents. So if you lose your temper with your dad, you're supposed to feel bad about that. You're, there's, a, there's a way you're supposed to be with your mother. If you, if you raised your voice towards her, if you didn't respond to her, if you ignored her, if you hurt her feelings, there's, there's a guilt that's supposed to come with that. Uh, similarly, if you didn't fulfill the rights of your wife or a wife didn't fulfill the rights of the husband, you're supposed to carry some level of bad feeling, some level of guilt. That's supposed to be there and that's actually something Allah put inside of us to help us do the right thing. This feeling of guilt actually is something Allah created inside of us. It's part of the mechanisms that help us steer us in the right direction. In fact, this feeling of guilt is so powerful that Allah even quotes, swears by it. I swear by the self that keeps blaming itself, that feels guilty, that keeps on feeling guilty. So guilt is a necessary emotion. However, guilt in the wrong place can actually be destructive. And I'm supposed to, and you're supposed to feel guilt towards Allah. That's the first thing that I want to remind myself and all of you of. We're supposed to have guilt towards Allah. And even if I did something wrong to one of you, 
you said salam to me, I didn't say wa alaikum as salam to you. I was arrogant with you. I was I was unkind towards you. Or I, you know, turned away from you, etc. I, I was rude to you in some way. I feel I should feel bad towards you, but actually, first and foremost, I've committed a crime, crime against my Rabb. I'm reminded of this place in Surah An-Nur, remarkably, where people are talking, and Allah describes a scene where people were talking about Aisha radiallahu anha. And Aisha radiallahu anha, when she was being talked about, not everybody was slandering her or saying bad things. They were just discussing, hey, isn't it so bad what's happening with her? Isn't it wrong that people are saying this and that about her, etc.? They were just talking. And even that just talking, you know, it, it creates a new ripple. The conversation stays alive. So even if you're not saying something bad, you're still keeping that negative conversation alive, right? So Allah Azza wa revealed in, in Surah An-Nur, among the many ayat, He said, you know, at the moment you heard it, how come you didn't say, you know, and then you're supposed to say, subhanallah. You're supposed to say, subhanallah. What does subhanallah have to do with this conversation? You know, the, the point of mentioning subhanallah, ma yakunu lana anna takallama bihada, the reason you were supposed to say that is because actually subhanallah is said when I commit a crime against Allah. Actually, when people commit shirk, Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us, Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yaquluna uluwan kabira. Subhanallah amma yasifun. Allah is too perfect above and beyond the things they describe him with, the things they say about him. So the tasbih of Allah, tanzihullahi amma la yaliquhu, to describe Allah in a way that is so perfect and to remove from him everything that isn't suitable to say about Allah. That's actually what we're saying when we say, Subhanallah. I know that in South Asian cultures, when you see something nice, you're like, oh, Subhanallah. Bade miya to bade miya, chote miya, Subhanallah. Right? So we have our own way of using Subhanallah. But the ancient Arabs, the way they use Subhanallah originally, and the way the Quran is using it on many occasions, is actually on, at instance, instances of blasphemy. When somebody said something so inappropriate about Allah, then the reaction to that is what? Subhanallah. And in fact, even the angels, when they questioned Allah and they said, Can you, are, are you really putting a human being on the earth that's going to spill blood and cause corruption? He's going to make all these problems. And Allah Azza wa told them, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know what you don't know. Right? That's what he told the angels. So the angels also felt like maybe they crossed the line. Maybe they asked too, too, tough of a, too, too uh, inappropriate of a question to Allah. They crossed the line with Allah. So they said, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana. You're too perfect, Ya Rabb. We, we have no knowledge except for what you taught us. So the, the term was being used in that context. Now, the reason I brought this up now is because here you are talking about somebody. They were talking about Aisha, whatever their intention, even if good intentions. But you were supposed to recognize that hurting someone else or talking about someone else that they wouldn't want to be talked about is actually not a crime against that person alone. That's a crime against Allah. That's actually a crime against Allah. Right, So that's why SubhanAllah was mentioned in that ayah. And now with that in mind, what I want to share with you is where does guilt go? My guilt is go supposed to go first towards Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And there's a huge difference between the guilt I have towards Allah and the guilt I have towards a person. And let's understand that a little bit. I'll give you practical, realistic examples. Like for instance, we have the case of you know, Yaqub alayhi salam's sons in the Quran. Right, So his sons messed up pretty bad. And they hurt their father for many, many years. They abused him. They called him insane. They taught their children to call him insane. They, caught, they taught their wives to call him insane. In fact, they weren't even home. They were with Yusuf alayhi salam. And when Yaqub alayhi salam heard the scent or smelled the scent of Yusuf's shirt, you know that the story, right? He wasn't home alone. He was with his daughter-in-laws and his grandchildren. Because the sons were not home. They were elsewhere. And he said, Lola and Tufanidun. He said, Inni la ajiduriha Yusuf. Lola and Tufani. He said, I can scent, I can smell the scent of Yusuf, despite the fact that you people, who's the you people? That's his daughter in laws and his grandchildren. You people think that I'm insane. Where did they learn to call him insane? From his own sons. And these are the sons that know that their father is, in fact, a prophet. They know that. They actually know that. They know that he's the son of Ishaq, who is the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Wa alayhi salam. So he, he, they know all of that, and yet they committed these horrible crimes inside of the family. 
It's one thing that you owe the best to your father because he's your father. On top of that, he's a prophet too. So the level to which they messed up cannot be undermined. There's a pretty serious degree of crime here. But at the end of it all, at the end of it all, the Quran seems to indicate that they felt bad about what they did. When they were finally confronted, when they were finally humbled, they feel bad about what they've been doing. And they come towards their dad. And they say that you should, you know, please make istighfar for us. Please pray for us. Which is a way of saying, by the way, you cannot pray for someone if you hate them or if you have a grudge against them. Right? So they're saying two things in one. They combined forgive us and pray for us all in one statement. Because you cannot pray for, you, he cannot pray for them if he hasn't already what? Forgiven them. Right? So when they said, you know, can you make istighfar to, to your Rabb for us? Then at that point, they're asking him to forgive. But he's a human being. And Yaqub salam has cried so much that he's lost his sight for a long time that Allah brought back because of the shirt. So it's not an easy, like, it's not, oh, this one time you hurt my feelings. This is years, years and years and years. And not only did they hurt Yusuf salam and their father, in fact, Yusuf's, you know, full brother, bin Yamin, they kept abusing him too. They kept hurting him too. So this is, this is a long history of crimes. So just one sorry is not going to cut it. That's not good enough. So even their father turns to them and says, Sofa astaghfiru lakum rabbi. He says, I will, not just yet. So the sofa, some of us comment here, yushir ila ta'khir. There's a little bit of a delay. He's saying, I'll get there. I'm not there yet. I'm not ready to forgive you yet. So they're feeling guilty towards their dad. And they're so saying sorry to their dad. And their dad is saying, I'm not entirely ready to pray for you yet. I will, hopefully, I'm not there yet. The reason I wanted to bring this up is because we have to understand the difference between the human ability or inability to forgive right away and the difference between that and who Allah is. Allah forgives right away. Allah forgives right away. You can be committing crimes against Allah for years and years and years. Sins on top of sins on top of sins. Knowingly and unknowingly. Ya Allah, I knew I had to pray. I still didn't pray. I knew that was wrong. I still did it. I knew that was haram. I still earned money that way. I knew that was wrong. I still lied about it in court. I still did this. I still did that. I did hurt this person because I was angry. I did this because I didn't care about it. I did this because I just didn't want to hear anything else. I was selfish at the time. I was drunk on my own emotions at the time. Whatever it was. And you can have so many crimes against Allah for so, 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 so long. And at the end of all of that, Allah just says, just make tawbah, just make istighfar, right? And He says, Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'ah. You know, Ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim. La taqnatu min rahmatillahi. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'ah. My slaves that have been crossed, that have done, been done, crossed the line. Asrafu. You know, they, they went past the line and they've been going past the line. They've lived a life of crossing the line. Don't lose hope in Allah's loving care. Allah will forgive all sins. Just come back. Just make istighfar. Right? But then, the, then that sounds too easy. And because we, only, we know that when you ask somebody else for forgiveness, they don't forgive that easily. So what we do is something that we don't realize we're doing. We do something in psychology. They call it projection. So we project the human inability to forgive right away because people are not forgiving. So you start assuming that Allah is also not immediately forgiving. How can Allah forgive? Do you know how much I messed up? I mean, I know I've heard the ayat about Allah forgiving, but bro, seriously, I did some Olympic level stuff. Like my stuff is on another level. So I don't think you understand how, how far off from forgiveness I particularly am. I cannot begin to tell you how many people write to me, tell me, I know Allah is angry with me. I know Allah hates me. I know Allah hates me. It's, it's an incredible volume of Muslims that believe that they are beyond forgiveness. They're beyond redemption. They are beyond that. And what I want you to know is, first of all, guilt is a good thing. That's where I started. Guilt is a good thing. But the wrong kind of guilt, the wrong kind of guilt is what? Allah will never forgive me. I'm too far gone. You know who believes Allah will never forgive him? Iblis. He actually believes that. And if I share that belief with him, then I've joined the wrong team. I cannot believe that about myself. 
You cannot believe that about yourself, that Allah will never forgive. You cannot do that. You can't do that to yourself. The other thing that's tied to this that I wanted to share with you is we say things like Allah is angry with me, Allah hates me. It's remarkable that in the Quran, even though karaha and karahiya and yakrahu, the verb, is used to hate, is used. But Allah doesn't use the word hate for himself, for people. Like Allah doesn't say, Inna Allah yakrahu kada wa kada. Allah hates so. He says, Inna Allah la yuhib. Is Allah doesn't love. Allah does not love. He goes that far. He says he does not love certain kinds of people. But he never says he hates certain kinds of people. In fact, when Allah does mention hate with himself, he mentions some kind of action with it. So, karihallahum bi'athahum, for example. Allah, Allah hated that these people should come along. So he'll mention an action that he hates. But he doesn't mention people that he hates. The farthest he goes in the Quran, he says he doesn't love certain kinds of people. He doesn't, his, they, they stop qualifying for Allah's love, which brings me to the next opposite extreme. On the one hand, there are people who have so much guilt, Allah will never forgive. On the other hand, there are people that go further than even Christians. God is love, man. Allah forgives. Why you got to feel guilty about it all the time? Allah will forgive. Allah understands. Allah gets me like you don't get it. I have this special connection with Allah. He gets my situation. Allah will forgive. Allah has unconditional love. I love this phrase, unconditional love. There's no such thing. It's not even in the Quran. But we like to throw it around because we've heard it in a movie or somewhere. And we think that it applies in our religion. There is no such thing as unconditional love. That, that isn't the case. If that was the case, Allah would say the same for the people who commit crimes, who kill, who murder, who He says, Inna Allah la yuhibbu al-zalimeen, wallahu la yuhibbu al-zalimeen. Allah doesn't love the zalimeen. And on the other hand, He says, wallahu yuhibbu al-muhsineen. Allah loves those who try to do their best. So He's describing some people that He loves and some people that He doesn't love. Clearly, there are conditions. Clearly, there are conditions. You cannot say it's unconditional love. Allah loves no matter what. Allah provides, Allah shows care, Allah shows love, but there's a level of love for, from Allah that you have to qualify for. You have to meet certain conditions. I have to meet certain conditions to get there. And one of the most beautiful ones among them is in Allah yuhibbu tawabin wa yuhibbu mutatahirin. Allah loves those people who keep coming back to Him. They feel bad and they come back to Him. They fix course, they correct their ways. So I know as you're listening to this, many of you might have tons of questions about your own personal situation. I'll just tell you one, one or two things. It may well be that I have wronged somebody and they are not ready to forgive me. They're not ready to forgive me. Fine. But you know what? You cannot take the next step. If, if for example, I'm not ready to forgive someone, I cannot say, and by the way, on judgment day, I'm going to tell Allah what you did. I, I'm gonna, I will, Allah will ask for me. That is an extremely arrogant, out of place thing to say. It's out of place. Let me tell you why. Allah describes judgment that He says, لَا يَتَكَلَّمُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَانِ Nobody will speak on that day except the one Ar-Rahman gave permission to. Except you apparently will say, excuse me Allah, this guy over here, one day at a Tim Hortons, you see, culturally relevant. So Tim Hortons, you know what he said to me? I want to deal with that. For, no, you're not going to be in a position to talk about anybody else. So this idea that you have that somehow judgment day is when you get to get, yeah, Allah will say, no, let me hear your complaints first. <laughs> let me get your situation out of there because you have special VIP status on judgment day. This is an extremely arrogant and, and, and almost blasphemous thing to say. That we say, oh, Allah will never forgive you. Really? I have the right to say about someone, Allah will never forgive them? Where did I get this email from? What wahi came to me that Allah will never forgive them? Allah told Musa alayhi salam that maybe Fir'aun can earn forgiveness. Maybe Fir'aun can turn around. But you apparently know for a fact that your mother-in-law is going to hell. You know this for a fact. So, <laughs> so there, there is a... We, we have to fix... Certain things. First of all, if you, if, if you can't forgive someone, don't assume Allah won't forgive them. And this brings me to my last problem. This is actually a real problem somebody brought to my attention. They said, well, I don't forgive this person, but they made tawbah. And they've tried to apologize and they've tried to fix 
things, but I still can't forgive them. Fine, I can't forgive them. I have a problem. What's the problem? Brother, I feel like they're praying and they've made toba, and maybe Allah will forgive them and they're going to be in Jannah. And I don't want to hang out with them in Jannah because I, I didn't forgive them. Like, I, uh, here I am, like, finally made it and I hate this guy and he's next door. Like, hey. Like, why would Allah let them be forgiven if I haven't forgiven them? And that's actually, some people carry that with them. Like, this person doesn't deserve forgiveness. One of my anxieties is, what if Allah forgives them? So the, the, the problem with this kind of thinking is first and foremost, we forget who Allah is sometimes. Allah is not going to do things based on our feelings. Allah will do things based on His Rahmah and of course on justice. My concept of justice, this brain is very small. It's very small. And in my head, there's some definition of what is justice and injustice. I cannot go to Allah and say, Ya Allah, let me tell you what justice is. This guy should not have a house in Jannah. There was a mistake in the calculations. Bring back the angels. We need to do a re-audit re of his hisab because he shouldn't be. <laughs> because you know what's happening now? You are questioning Allah's divine wisdom. If Allah decides to forgive someone, that's in the hikmah of Allah, in the knowledge of Allah. And I have to humble myself and not feel like unless I see them burning, I won't be satisfied. I'm, I can guarantee you, you will, they will not be your concern when you get up on Judgment Day. I can guarantee you. They may be a huge concern for you right now, they are not going to be a problem for you on Judgment Day. In fact, people, forget people you hate, people you love you won't care about on Judgment Day. You're going to be worried about who? Yourself. You're not going to be worried about anybody else. And there's one last piece of this problem. When we are resurrected, when we are raised again, we are not raised the same way we were now. We will pull out any bad feelings they used to carry inside of their chest. We're going to pull them out. All of the ill feelings that, were, that used to be carried inside of the chest, they're going to be pulled out. Jannah, we are almost a new species. We're a new existence. Khalqan akhar, actually. We're a new creation altogether. In fact, even among the Sahaba, sometimes there were conflicts. And Allah described in the Quran, Ikhwanan ala sururim mutaqabilin. Brothers, sitting on couches, facing each other. You ever been to a party, you're sitting in front of someone, you don't like them? The party gets, the food doesn't taste good anymore. Why is this guy here? You want to go somewhere else, you want to go in the backyard, or even if it's snowing outside, you're, you're going to eat your samosas outside. Because you don't want to see that guy's face. You can't face people you don't like. But the Quran describes one of the, one of the remarkable things in Jannah, people, even among believers, when they had conflicts with each other, all of that will be removed. Removed. And you will actually be facing each other happily. That's one of the, one of the remarkable, renewed things that are go that's going to happen in Jannah. So guilt, place it in the right place. Don't let somebody else guilting you turn into Allah won't forgive me. Don't do that. And don't allow, I shouldn't allow my sense of justice and think I can impose that onto Allah and then decide or decide for Allah how judgment day is going to work. Imagine if that's how it worked, then my, if my feelings are so valid, then the next person's feelings should be valid too. And the other person's feelings should be valid too. Because they all have feelings. You know? لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ Reality is not based on your wishes. It's not going to work according to your wishes. Allah Azza wa Jal is Al-Hakim. Al-Adl. He will make his decisions based on wisdom. And once we have faith in that, we can find some comfort in that. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us a, a true sense of comfort in knowing that the best judge is in fact Allah Azza wa Jal. May Allah remove from our hearts the desire to see somebody else punished. That desire itself, it takes away space from your heart that should be taken up by my desire, my own desire to be forgiven. There's enough things for me to worry about for myself, and now I'm worried about somebody else should get punished. Let Allah deal with that. That is with Allah. That's you know that their their amr is with Allah, but my amr is with me. I have to dis I have to send for myself. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us self-aware and remove these ill feelings from our hearts, and especially allow us to be in the company of better people than us in Qiyamah and, and beyond Qiyamah, that we can face each other with joy. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim.
الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا للصلاة حيا للفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين إذا وقعت الواقعة ليس لوقعتها كاذبة خافضة رافعة إذا رجت الأرض رجا وبست الجبال بسا فكانت هباء منبثا وكنتم أزواجا ثلاثة فأصحاب الميمنة ما أصحاب الميمنة وأصحاب المشأمة ما أصحاب المشأمة والسابقون السابقون أولئك المقربون في جنات النعيم ثلة من الأولين وقليل من الآخرين الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين فلا أقسم بمواقع النجوم وإنه لقسم لو تعلمون عظيم إنه لقرآن كريم في كتاب مكنون لا يمسه إلا المطهرون تنزيل من رب العالمين أفبهذا الحديث أنتم مدهنون وتجعلون رزقكم أنكم تكذبون الله أكبر 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله I hope you guys enjoyed that video clip. My team and I have been working tirelessly to try to create as many resources for Muslims to give them first steps in understanding the Quran all the way to the point where they can have a deep, profound understanding of the Quran. We are students of the Quran ourselves and we want you to be students of the Quran alongside us. Join us for this journey on BayinaTV.com where thousands of hours of work have already been put in and don't be intimidated, it's step by step by step so you can make learning the Quran a part of your lifestyle. There's lots of stuff available on YouTube but it's all over the place. If you want an organized approach to studying the Quran beginning to end for yourself, your kids, your family and even among peers, that would be the way to go. Sign up for BayinaTV.com.